Have you ever heard of a living fossil? It's a descriptive, if imprecise, term. Living fossils are plants and creatures that give us a glimpse of our world before humans. Most were first identified in the fossil record, but even after millions of years, they or closely related species are still recognizable to this day. Today, our world has thousands of different kinds of moss alone, and many of our forests are dense with trees that have broad green leaves. But if we had a time machine and could travel back tens of millions of years, how different would the plants be around us? Let's take a closer look. This is ASU. If we went back 40 million years to the Cretaceous period and took a look around at the type of plants that were most common, you would see a lot of needle-covered plants. Plants like pine trees, which are part of a group of plants that scientists call gymnosperms. During this period, needle-type plants were the most abundant type of plants on Earth. There were just a few flowering plants, or angiosperms, that were showing up at the time. Jumping back in our time machine and returning to the present day, we see that those few flowering plants have taken over the planet, at least as far as plants go. Flowering plants are everywhere. They now make up 80% of all the plants you see on land. Where did all those flowering plants come from, and how have they come to dominate the plant world? It turns out that the answer is tied up in the cells for these two types of plants, gymnosperms and angiosperms, and their genomes. A genome is the set of DNA that holds the instructions for living things. That DNA is found in most of the cells in an organism. Our modern day angiosperms have gone through a downsizing process to make their genomes more compact. This allows the plant to pack more cells into a smaller space, including some important cells called stomata. This word comes from the Greek for mouth, which makes sense. These cells are where plants pull in carbon dioxide and expel oxygen and water in a process called photosynthesis. This exchange of gases is the opposite of what animals do when they breathe in O2 and expel CO2. Okay, so if more cells can pack into a plant, what does that do? Well, it allows the plant to have more stomata and veins than needle-type plants. And that makes them much better at photosynthesis. The more stomata, the more efficient and successful the plant because it can exchange more carbon dioxide with oxygen and water. The plant can make more food in the form of sugars, and with more veins, it can transport more materials throughout the plant. This turns out to be an example where downsizing has been a huge benefit. It benefits the angiosperm plants that have taken over the plant world. It also benefits animals because these plants exchange more carbon dioxide for oxygen than the gymnosperm plants. Thanks to this successful strategy, our planet is now blanketed with a myriad colorful flowering angiosperms. Without the help of that time machine, how easy is it to imagine a world without them? Flowers line our walkways and roads. We enjoy blossoming trees in spring. Throughout human history, different blooms have been used in motifs for gifts and given different symbolism. From weeds to trees, angiosperms have taken over the world. If you want to dig deeper into how flowering plants went from Cretaceous period upstarts to modern day old guard, check out ASU's Ask a Biologist page. Our story, Angiosperms, a guide to world domination, can help you grow your science knowledge and start you on your path to reading scientific articles. This was ASU, thanks for watching.